Well, I wonder, have you ever heard of the law of diminishing marginal utility? You're thinking, what on earth did you just say? <laughs> the law of diminishing marginal utility. Maybe if you've studied economics, you've heard that extremely long and difficult, hard to say phrase before. Uh, but it pretty much means the more you consume something, the less return you get from it. The more you consume something, the less return you get from it. Let me give you an everyday example. Uh, imagine you're in school one day, and uh, as the day drags on, it gets closer to home time, you think to yourself, I would love a galaxy chocolate bar. And you start thinking about this galaxy chocolate bar, and you think, oh, how good would it be? And you start drooling with the thought of this galaxy chocolate bar. And as soon as you leave school, you go straight to the spa, and you don't buy one galaxy chocolate bar, but you actually buy four. That's how desperate you are for a galaxy chocolate bar. And so you eat the first one, and you think, oh, this was so good. And then you eat the second one, and it's pretty good too. And then you eat the third one, and it's pretty good as well. But by the time you get to the fourth one, you actually don't really enjoy it that much. You really want to be sick. <laughs> Isn't it true that the first chocolate bar was the most satisfying one? The second one was slightly less satisfying than that. The third one was slightly less satisfying than that. And the least satisfying one was the fourth one. The further you go, the less return you get. The further you consume the product, the less satisfying it becomes. The law of diminishing marginal utility. And, you know, we get that similar experience as we read the Bible on certain passages like the one we've just read, Daniel chapter 6. Here's a passage which the first time we consumed it or the first time we heard it, oh, we thought this is an amazing story. Daniel in the lion's den, unbelievable. But the more time goes on and the more you hear the story, its effect, its punch becomes less effective on you. To the point where, as you read it now, as you've read it maybe a hundred times growing up, you kind of just think, ah, yeah, cool story but not that great. Well, my prayer is as we read this passage again this evening and as we look at it together, that it wouldn't lose its punch in you, even though it's a familiar story, that you would be in awe of what God has been doing and what God has done in Daniel's life in chapter six of this great book. I want you to see five things as we work through uh, this chapter. The first thing I want you to see is a new king, a new king. If you've been following with us in the book of Daniel, we've become very familiar with one specific king, and that is King Nebuchadnezzar. He's been the guy on the throne. He's been the central figure in Babylon. But you might remember at the end of our last talk in chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and humiliated, and ultimately his rule came to a crashing end. And then in chapter 5, we're introduced to a new king called King Belshazzar. But if you cast your eye down to the very last verse of chapter 5, you'll see that King Belshazzar has now died. And now in chapter 6, verse 1, another king is now on the throne in Babylon. And that is, as you can see from verse 1, a guy called King Darius. And King Darius is someone we know very little about. But as he takes the throne, he tries to get all of his admin in place. He starts implementing his system for Babylon. And Daniel has a very key role in this new system. King Darius holds Daniel in extremely high regard. Look at verse 3 with me. It says, then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel's been given a high ranking position in King Darius's new system. So we see firstly a new king, but notice secondly, a corrupt plan, a corrupt plan. Jealousy is something which is rampant in our world and it's something which we see all around us and something which, if we're totally honest, we experience in our own lives, that we get jealous of other people and other things. But very often, nothing good comes from jealousy. And that's exactly the case in chapter 6 of Daniel. Here we have Daniel, who's got this new high-ranking position, but no sooner is he appointed to this position than do all the other officials in Babylon become extremely jealous of him. And as you read through the passage, you'll see they become so jealous with Daniel that they actually try to frame him. They try and find some sort of accusation that they can labor against Daniel, which they can bring to King Darius to get Daniel knocked off his position. But the problem that they come across in verse 4 is that they can't actually find any valid accusation against Daniel. They can't find anything that he's done wrong. He's someone who has walked with integrity his whole life. He's been blameless before the king. They need some sort of justifiable reason to have Daniel removed from his position, but they cannot seem to find one. They're probably desperately trying to find an occasion where maybe Daniel stole money off King Darius or maybe was slacking on the job, but they could find no such example. And so they have to kind of get their brains together, all these high-ranking officials, and think to themselves, we need a clever ploy to get Daniel removed from his position. We need a clever ploy to have some sort of accusation against Daniel. What could we do? And finally, they came up with a pretty smart suggestion, pretty smart idea. They think, 
Well, Daniel's very loyal to his God. That's maybe one thing that could get him in trouble. It's got him in trouble in the past, his loyalty to God. Maybe it could get him in trouble again. And so as you read these verses, you can see uh, what they do. They come up with this clever scheme. They go before King Darius and say, King Darius, we think you should make a new rule. A new rule whereby everyone must pray and bow down to you and no one else. And anyone who does pray or bow down to any other god apart from you, King Darius, that person should be fed to the lions. And King Darius, no doubt, thought this is a great idea. I mean, who doesn't want to be worshipped? And so you can see in verse 9 that King Darius signs this injunction. Now it's legally binding in Babylon. If you pray to any other god, you will be fed to the lions. So firstly, a new king. Secondly, a corrupt plan. Thirdly, then, notice a faithful servant. Faithful servant. I wonder what it takes for you to shy away from expressing your faith. What does it take for you to shy away from expressing your faith? Maybe it's when you're in the sports changing room and the dirty jokes are flying around. And you kind of think, "Ah, I could express my faith, but I'm just going to blend into the crowd. Or maybe it's on a Monday morning when you're sitting in the classroom and everyone's talking about all the stuff they got up to over the weekend. And you think, I could speak up and tell them what I did over the weekend, go to church, but uh, that would make me look a bit weird. And so you shy away from expressing your faith. Or maybe it's whenever there's particular ethical discussions happening amongst your peers and maybe they talk about things like abortion and same-sex marriage and you know to express a biblical worldview would have you seen as a bigot. And so you kind of think to yourself, oh, I'll just blend in. I'll shy away from the crowd and expressing my faith. Sometimes it doesn't take much for us to shy away from expressing our faith, if we're totally honest. But for Daniel, even the most severe punishment could not stop him from expressing his faith. For Daniel, the risk isn't just that he looks a bit weird or he receives a few awkward stares or that he's told something that he doesn't want to hear. No, the risk for Daniel is that he's going to be fed to the lions. Yet even that cannot stop Daniel from expressing his faith. Look how he responds to the imminent threat on his life. Verse 10, it says this. When Daniel knew that this document had been signed, he went to the house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. See, Daniel just continues his regular pattern of faithfulness. He had regularly went up to his room and prayed three times a day by the window And so Daniel says, no external threat is going to stop me from continuing this daily pattern of walking faithfully before my God. And so Daniel just continues this pattern which he had been doing previously. No threat could stop him from living out his faith and expressing it towards others. And of course, course, these other high officials were probably rubbing their hands thinking, our plan has worked. There's Daniel and he's praying to God. He's broken the rules of this new treaty that we've made. And so they straight away go to King Darius. King Darius, remember that document you'd signed? How anyone who prayed to any other god should be fed to the lions? Well, that Daniel one, well, he's broken the rules. And King Darius is now in a pretty difficult situation. Why? Well, look at verse 14 and 15 with me. It says this. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. King Darius is in a really difficult position. He's caught in two minds. On the one hand, he really likes Daniel. He knows that he's got an excellent spirit in him. He maybe even counts him kind of as a friend. And so he doesn't want Daniel to be punished. But on the other hand... King Darius knows that he signed this injunction. It's legally binding. There's no way of escaping that. And so what does King Darius do? He really likes Daniel, but if he's to be upright and and fulfill the law which he set in motion, Daniel must be fed to the lions. So we see a new king, a corrupt plan, a faithful servant. Notice, fourthly, a great escape. A great escape. King Darius is in a really difficult position, but we get many hints throughout the passage that King Darius really liked Daniel and really didn't want to have to go through with this ordeal of feeding Daniel to the lion's den. But unfortunately, King Darius decides, I must uphold my word. I must feed Daniel to the lions. And so that's what he reluctantly does. But as you look through the passage, you can see the many examples and the many hints as to how much King Darius did not want to do that. You can see in verse 16, he he prays and says to Daniel, May your Lord deliver you from this. I know your Lord has delivered you from things like this in the past. May he deliver you again. 
You can see in verse 17 when Darius seals the lion's den with a stone. He does so with a signet and he prays that, that Daniel would be saved and rescued. You can see in verse 18 that that night after feeding Daniel to the lion's den, Darius could not sleep. Verse 19, you can see when he finally did get to sleep, as soon as he woke up the next morning, the first thing he did was to go straight to the lion's den to see what had become of Daniel. And in verse 20, as he checks the lion's den, he pleads that Daniel might be rescued. And so what comes of Daniel? Fed to the lion's den for his faithfulness to the one true God. It's a picture of hopelessness, isn't it? You think as you read the story at this point, ah, oh, the great Daniel has died. But that's when we see the massive twist in the story. As Daniel is in this lion's den, as Darius comes to peek in the next morning after Daniel has been in there probably 8 to 12 hours with hungry lions. Look what happens. Uh, verse 21. It says, Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in God. It's astonishing, isn't it? Daniel had spent 8 to 12 hours with the lions, yet God had miraculously shut their mouths so that Daniel walked away completely unharmed. Yet another example of God doing the unthinkable. God intervening into human history and doing something that only he could do to once again show his faithfulness to his people. In this case, Daniel. And so we saw a new king, a corrupt plan, a faithful servant, a great escape. But notice fifthly and finally, a new decree. A new decree. King Darius is obviously delighted that Daniel has been freed and he discovered that this was really a ploy made against him by these other high-ranking officials. And so he actually demanded that all those high-ranking officials who framed Daniel, they themselves be fed to the lions. And this time, without God's intervention, the lions eat them up and destroy them. This leads to a great song of praise from um, King Darius. You can read of that in verses 26 and 27. But as this chapter closes, it's another amazing chapter, isn't it? But the question we always ask, and we should ask, is this. What on earth does this passage mean for me? What does this mean for me? And there are many themes which we've seen the whole way through Daniel, which are also true of this passage, aren't they? Uh, themes like God's sovereignty. God is really in control of all things. We see that once again here. The theme, which is our theme for the week, of God's faithfulness. God is undoubtedly faithful to his people. Yet again, chapter 6 has proven that to be immeasurably true. But the big theme of chapter 6 really is this, God's ability to deliver his people. God's ability to deliver his people. That's a, a major theme in chapter 6 of Daniel. But the question is this, what does that actually mean for you and I? What does it mean that God is able to deliver us? Of course God delivered Daniel in chapter 6. He was fed to the lion's den, but God shut their mouths. What's the application for me? Does that mean that Say, I'm one day chucked into the lion's den for my faith in Jesus. Does that mean that the lions won't harm me? Does that mean that any time I'm almost at the point of suffering physical persecution for my faith, God's going to intervene and make sure that I'm free from harm? Is that what it means? Of course the answer is no. There are many other characters in the Bible who suffered physical harm for their faith in God. Uh, there are countless Christians throughout history. In fact, even today, there will be thousands of Christians who are physically harmed for their faith. Around our world, people are being murdered, shot, ravaged from their homes, burned alive, some maybe even fed to lions. That stuff is happening. People are dying. Christians are dying for their faith. And so our application of chapter 6 cannot be that God is going to always protect us from any physical harm. That's just not the case. Rather, the point of chapter 6 and the deliverance we read of in chapter 6 is to point us forward to a far greater deliverance. Not a deliverance from a bunch of lions but deliverance from sin. You see, chapter 6 of the book of Daniel, like many of the other examples we've seen so far, is pointing us forward and pointing us up to the greater story of the Bible, the story of God's plan to rescue his people. You see, this story echoes the story of Jesus, does it not? I'm sure as we read through this chapter, you've seen so many of the parallels of Jesus' story and Daniel's story. Because Daniel, yet again, is being cast as this preview or this foreshadow of the greater Daniel, the ultimate deliverer, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, like Daniel, walked blamelessly before his God. Uh, Jesus, like Daniel, had been given a position of great authority. 
Jesus, like Daniel, however, found that other high-ranking people were very jealous of him. And so Jesus, like Daniel, found himself the victim of a terrible ploy. And so Jesus, like Daniel, ultimately suffered under the hands of weak leadership. Not King Darius, but Pontius Pilate, who himself was legally bound to have Jesus put in the firing line, even though he did not deserve it. But Jesus, unlike Daniel, though they both faced up to this punishment, Jesus faced the full force of that punishment. As Jesus goes to the cross and faces the wrath of God and faces the punishment for sin that you and I deserve to pay. But why? So that we could be delivered. Not from famine, not from poverty, not from trials, not from physical harm, but we could be delivered from the greatest problem that humans face, the problem of sin. You see, Jesus went to the cross so that he could be our substitute. Jesus went to the cross so that he could take our place because all of us contribute to the problems of this world. All of us have a problem, a disease called sin. It expresses itself in many different ways. We see it globally all the time in wars and in, in fights and in all these issues and riots and racism. But it doesn't just exist out there. It also exists in here. The same root problem exists in all of our hearts. And so we deserve eternal separation from God. We deserve eternal judgment from God. Yet God in his great love for us sent a deliverer in Jesus who willingly took the punishment for that sin on our behalf. So that when we put our trust in him to deliver us, like this in chapter 6 of Daniel, we can be spared from that judgment. And as we live on earth now, we will face difficulties and trials and, and maybe even physical persecution. But for eternity, we will be delivered from the presence of sin as we enter into the new heavens and the new earth and spend an eternity with God. Because, you know, God is a God of justice. All sin must be punished. And so everyone's sin is a big deal. Your sin's a big deal. A world's sin is a big deal. Every sin must be punished. But we've only really got two options. Option one is that we pay for our sins when we die, which is what we deserve to happen. But the other option is that we allow Jesus to pay for our sins at the cross. And so if you, like Daniel, put trust and faith in your God's ability to deliver you from your sins through his sending of his son, the Lord Jesus, you can know and you can have full confidence that God will deliver you. Not from a life of difficulty and pain right now, but from an eternity of hell and separation from him forevermore. And so I would plead with you to consider that as you think about the story of Daniel, as you think about God's faithfulness. Remember that God has been so faithful to his people and God will be faithful to his people for all of eternity because those who put their trust in him will escape an eternity of deserved punishment and in contrast will live an eternity in heaven with Jesus without the presence of sin in our midst.